All right, here we are, uh, Stress Busters. That's the name of the, uh, of the course. Uh, we're on lesson number eight of this uh, course, and the title of today's lesson is Stress from Burnout. Stress from Burnout. Well, uh, burnout is a term which has come into popular uh, usage in the last 40 years or so. Uh, the most common definition of burnout is the following a state of physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion. I feel burnt out just saying all of that. A state of physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual exhaustion. It is most uh, evident in people who work in the helping professions, for example, you know, nurses, doctors, social workers, uh, teachers, uh, ministers, uh, public safety, uh, individuals, uh, many of these types of people suffer from burnout. Of course, everyone is subject to burnout and its effect on the individual. Uh, for example, athletes burn out uh, from the pressure of intense competition. Uh, parents burn out from the uh, insistent demands of providing for a family, especially uh, young children. Students burn out because of the weight of their need to succeed and all of the deadlines that they, uh, that they have. Now in the relationship between stress and burnout, we can say that burnout is the final stage that overstress uh, produces in our, in our lives. So in our eighth lesson in this series, we're looking at things that cause not just stress, but things that actually cause uh, burnout. So let's talk about the experience of burnout itself, what it feels like, what the, what the symptoms are. I guess the best way to explain it is that burnout comes on as a fizzle and not as an explosion. It's like a balloon that is losing its air, you know, slowly but surely, you know, slowly but surely the balloon loses all of its air. It's important that we can identify and understand the process because like grieving, much of the pain is caused by ignorance and many times burnout uh, and those who are victimized by burnout uh, are their own worst enemies. Uh, they don't realize what's happening to them and they make matters worse for themselves by magnifying their problems in the effort uh, to get better. And so there are four stages in the, in the burnout process. Uh, the first stage is the mountaintop. The mountaintop uh, usually starts with a, a new beginning uh, or a, a new job or a new marriage or a career. Uh, it's a time of high idealism and high enthusiasm and high energy, a new company, a startup. You know, you're gonna start up your own business or your own uh, internet uh, company. A lot of times this uh, high level of enthusiasm and idealism begins to kind of grate against unexpected uh, and the unexpected grind of, of uh, everyday life. And uh, this of course leads to stage two in the burnout process. And that is the reality check moment. The reality check moment. This is the moment when our expectations and idealism come into contact with reality. Uh, there's usually a, a dip in enthusiasm. Uh, we become emotionally and physically tired. We become detached from people that we care about and things that are important to us. For example, I, I used to see this happen to freshmen in college when I worked as the Dean of Students for uh, Oklahoma Christian University. And I would see these freshmen, you know, they would arrive at orientation uh, with the uh, recruiting brochures and they were full of energy and enthusiasm and they would get on our campus and, you know, they may have not said it out loud, but I could hear them talking among themselves, the, the guys, you know, wow, there's like 2000 girls single women on this campus. And of course uh, the girls would be saying, wow, there's there 2000 uh, single Christian men 
uh, on this campus and they were excited to, to meet them all, I guess. And of course, the idea of freedom from parents and life in the dorms with friends. And it was just going to be so wonderful. And then the five week grades would come in. And a lot of the uh, students that were enthusiastic five weeks previously, uh, they hit the reality check wall and they began to you know, sleep all the time and lose interest in class and in their friends. Why? Uh, because what they thought that college was going to be was not exactly what college was. There was this thing called attending class. There was this thing called uh, studying. There was this thing called turning in your reports on time and uh, so on and uh, so forth. And so the five week grades usually served as a reality check. Uh, and uh, once they, uh, uh, you know, their expectations of all the great fun and wonderful things they were going to do in college, hit that reality check wall, uh, the stress level started to go up. Now, if there isn't some sort of intervention at this point, a person can slip very easily into the next stage of burnout, which is depression. Uh, de uh, this stage is characterized by chronic exhaustion. Uh, people become so physically and emotionally exhausted at the end of a just normal day that sleep is not enough to restore them. Uh, this is also the stage where uh, there are various physical symptoms as well. Uh, headaches and heart palpitations, uh, increased uh, blood pressure and stomach problems. Also uh, emotional symptoms like irritability and uh, resentfulness and depression, even among young people that you would see at uh, university. Usually that, that, that period after the reality check, a lot of people were sick and they, they, they had to go home. Uh, some people get to this stage and they stay there for a long time before getting help or, or, or getting worse. Uh, they're not themselves, but they don't know what's wrong. So they sort of gut it out as best they can. And then eventually they slide down to stage number four, which is obsession. This is the most serious stage and one where our burnout usually becomes evident uh, to the people around us. We become obsessed with what is happening to us and we can no longer see what is happening uh, uh, to anyone else. Uh, we're completely self-centered and focused. People become totally apathetic and they try to avoid work or responsibility. They become uh, impersonal and detached and unsympathetic towards other people. And physically, the symptoms of burnout can become actually life-threatening at this point. And it is at this point that we are emotionally and spiritually worn out. Now, there may be some people here who have been uh, at this point uh, or maybe on the way. Uh, I've been to stage three several times in my career, but thanks be to God and uh, a wonderful wife, uh, I've been able to find you know, my balance again. And so there are things to realize about burnout, some things that you need to understand about burnout. First of all, burnout is not a sin. There's no shame involved. Usually it's the result of too many things happening too quickly and not enough personal resources to handle them. So burnout is, is not failure. And unfortunately, many people think that burnout is failure, but it, it's not failure. Secondly, you're usually the last person to know that you're burned out. <laughs> it seems uh, uh, obvious to everyone else who sees it uh, except you. And you accept it when you are almost burnt out to a crisp uh, and you have no choice anymore, usually uh, because of a serious illness or you, you do something that is completely uncharacteristic of, you, of, of yourself. And then eventually, you know, uh, you begin to realize and to accept the fact that you're, you're burnt out. And then maybe one other idea, uh, there needs to be some changes made 
in order to recover from burnout and, and, and also to avoid it in the future. You know, uh, I kept going around in the same cycle myself of reaching the mountaintop and then slipping down into depression until I changed some things in my life. And that's common with a lot of people. They get, you know, they get to, to burn out and somebody you know, pulls them out of the fire and they, they rest and they, they, they get what they need to, to be better physically, you know what I'm saying? And uh, eventually they go back to work or they go back to school. But when they do that, they repeat all the same mistakes that they made the first time and eventually fall into the same trap. Uh, and that cycle will repeat itself several times until significant changes are made. Now, we learned in the very first lesson of this series that stress is, is a good thing by itself. It's necessary in order to be productive. It's when we are overstressed that we have problems and we burn out. And burnout is usually the extreme result of constant overstress and over uh, stimulation, good and bad, good and bad. Uh, I remember our son one Christmas, uh, he happened to get a lot of presents, you know, a grandma and grandpa and the parents and the uncles and the aunts, a lot of people bought him gifts, you know, that Christmas. And he sat there for an hour opening one present after another, you know, and I mean, he was, you know, there was a mountain of paper all around him. And, boxes of gifts and toys and puzzles and all kinds of sports things and money and you know and so we we left them to unwrap his gifts you know and we carried on uh, with some food and conversation with the other adults and at some point i noticed he was sitting there crying and i went over and asked him i said paul uh, what's wrong, son? You know, isn't it, isn't it a wonderful uh, Christmas? And he said, it's all gone. I have nothing left to open. <laughs> In other words, there was too much. He couldn't handle the stimulation uh, of, of having so many gifts uh, to open. And we're like that sometimes. Sometimes it's bad things that happen to us, but sometimes too many good things are taking place. Just too many, you know, things that stimulate us are taking place and we're not able to handle all of that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, uh, you know, movie stars or, or people who uh, win, uh, you know, they've, they've practiced and trained their whole life and they, they win the prize finally. And then they have a dip afterwards and they become depressed. And we, we wonder, what's the problem? Overstimulation, you know, uh, too many good things, too many cameras going off, too much applause, too much yelling and screaming, too much adulation. A lot of uh, musicians, for example, and uh, popular bands and popular, you know, singers and so on and so forth, you, you see them uh, using drugs and, 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 uh, and other things uh, to, to kind of deal uh, with the overstimulation uh, uh, that is common in their, in their profession. All these things are linked together uh, and, and cause a, a kind of a burnout. So you can burn out from a lot of you know, bad things happening to you, but you can burn out also from a lot of good things happening to you too fast too quickly, or you can't handle them. So how do you deal with the cycle? Everyone, of course, is subject to burnout because life has a variety of experiences that cause stress that can lead to burnout. Here's some practical ideas to help grow, or to help you rather, as Christians, deal with stress in general and the burnout cycle in uh, particular. First of all, Realize that there is a time for everything. Very important to realize that there is a time for everything. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter three, there's an appointed time for everything. And there's a time for every event under heaven, 
a time to give birth and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to shun embracing, a time to search and a time to give up as lost, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear apart and a time to sew together, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. You see, we are conditioned to think of life in evolutionary terms in our society. In other words, things should just go from like zero to a hundred, you know, just things that just keep getting better and better from poor to excellent without interruption. And when it doesn't, we become upset or frightened or guilty or worried or stressed. There is and will be a time for everything in your life, happiness as well as sadness, prosperity as well as want. There's no use being upset or worried. You know, some people they're stressed when they're in prosperity because they're afraid of losing their prosperity. And then of course, people are stressed in times of want because they think uh, that there will not be any more good times. We have to learn to enjoy uh, our blessings, to enjoy the times of our blessings and to be patient uh, during our times of want. You know, one follows the other. We need to be thankful when the good times are here and trust God and know that he will sustain us uh, when there are difficult times. You know, I, I've found that within each day, there's usually a mixture of sun and rain type events uh, in our lives. A second thing to help us deal with the stress and ultimate burnout that many experience. Uh, realize that you may not be able to change what is happening to you, but you can control how you react to it. In other words, you can't change things, but you can change yourself. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse six, Paul says, but if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Or if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which is effective in the patient enduring of the same sufferings, which we also suffer. So Paul here, he talks about the suffering that he has had to endure as an apostle, not because he sinned, but because of the gospel that he has preached. Uh, he was a victim of the evil of other people. Notice his attitude, however, he didn't just accept it as a given and a grim reality or resign himself to suffer in silence. He was actively overcoming his suffering and his injustice by observing how his perseverance was encouraging his disciples. In other words, he was suffering for preaching the gospel, but his patient endurance in his suffering was serving to encourage the people that he had preached to. You know, we, we have to learn how to suffer, to move beyond simply enduring pain and loss to using our suffering to glorify God and to, and to edify others. In other words, not to let our suffering go to waste, so to speak. We need uh, to see the difference between suffering that merely produces stress and suffering that produces growth. And the difference is our attitude uh, toward it. Number three, number three, realize that there is a relationship between how far we are from God and how stressed we are. Uh, people report that one of the major benefits that they received from some form of suffering was that it drew them nearer to God. Uh, the results of moral uh, evil and natural evil causes suffering. We read about that 
in Romans chapter six, verse 23, Paul says, the wage of sin is death, right? Not just death, like separation of the body from the soul, but death, you know, uh, uh, injustice is, is a form of death. Uh, victi uh, victimizing the poor is a form of uh, death. Uh, 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 falling prey to lust and other types of sin is death being expressed in our lives. Uh, and so Paul is saying the wage of all this, this sin is eventual, uh, eventual uh, death. Uh, and many times uh, we can't change uh, the past events. Uh, we can't heal the disease. We can't repair the relationship. We can't bring back uh, what was lost. All these things are a result of sin causing some form of death, if you wish. So we can't do all of this in order to ease the suffering and lower the stress, but we can always draw near to God and he will draw near to us as James uh, tells us in James chapter four, verse eight. And in doing so, we will receive not only the comfort we need to deal with the situation, but the strength to deal with it in a victorious way, in a way where it builds us up and it builds others up as well and not uh, destroy us. You see uh, what I'm saying? Uh, the idea is our suffering, uh, the mistakes that we make, the sins that happen and that we commit in our lives that causes suffering, we can use these things simply uh, as uh, an experience of suffering, uh, or uh, we can use all these things as an experience of growth. Or as Paul says, we can use these things as a way to encourage other people as they observe how we deal with failure, uh, with hurt, with loss. Uh, to turn it into something uh, positive, again, not only for ourselves, uh, but for other people. And when we're able to do that, that definitely lowers the stress that is caused by these uh, typical uh, sins and failings in our life. And so burnout happens as a result of wear and tear on the individual from a variety of factors. Psychologists have been able to identify these things in life that are especially wearing and stressful and when combined can lead to burnout. And so uh, I want you to do a couple of uh, tests here. Um, you've got a, a, some, um, uh, some uh, study sheets, of course. We always provide a study sheet uh, that you can use you know, to, uh, uh, to follow along the class. But in some of the uh, classes, We've got some uh, uh, bonus material. And in this particular class in lesson number eight, we have a couple of sheets. One is a burnout assessment uh, form and exercise, two exercises that you can do back to back there. And then there's the serious illness rating scale. Um, and uh, you follow the instructions on these and you can uh, give yourself a score as to how um, you know, how high the stress level is in your life. So the two exercises that I want you to do, first of all, uh, in one exercise, it requires that you mark how frequently you have experienced each of the statements that are, you know, listed. And then you make a total score. And then you compare your score with the, with the legend at the end of uh, the sheet. And then the second exercise helps measure the degree of stress that you may be under at the present time. And in this exercise, you circle the number of stress points awarded to each event that has happened to you in the last year. And then at the end, you total the points and you compare them again to the legend that's at the beginning of the sheet. And if you score 150 points or higher, then you have a, a, a high stress. Anyways, 
These uh, exercises hopefully will help you to get an idea of how stressed or how close to burnout that you might be. And remember, one of the major problems with people is denial. Uh, they refuse to admit that they may be burned out or they may be extremely overstressed. And these tests will help evaluate objectively uh, the level of stress that may exist in your life. Okay, well, in our next uh, and last um, lesson in the series, we're gonna do uh, a lesson entitled God's Prescription for Burnout. We've talked about burnout. We've talked about you know, how to recognize it and how it happens. Uh, but we said at the beginning of this uh, course that we're talking about stress and burnout from the perspective of Christians, Christians who are overstressed, Christians who are burned out. And so next week, God's prescription for uh, burnout among Christians. And I hope that you'll be uh, with us for the last lesson in this series. All right, thank you very much. God bless you, we'll see you next time, bye-bye.